if I would have told you how much all this stuff, recording, analog, going to digital, everything was going to change, how we'd be able to do it on our phones, how all this stuff, if I would have told you that when you and I met in the early 90s, what would you have said to me? I, I could tell it was coming. I anticipated it. Not that I'm any genius or anything, but this idea, let's say, for example, of the analog board, where it's all spread out left to right, and you have to move from one side, you know, way down here and work on this. But as soon as you work down here, now you're not in the sweet spot of the speakers any longer. So I knew, yeah, that someday there'd be a mixing board where you could sit in one place in the sweet spot and have the faders come to you. That just seems so logical to me. And so now we have mixing boards where, sure enough, the faders come to you. So you can move the faders around and they are always right in front of you and the speakers are right there. So this concept of nonlinear editing, which is what digital recording is all about, uh, and uh, uh, automated mixing consoles. You know, we used to spend uh, all this time, I mentioned Rich Ford, and trying to get the drum gates to work on the Bad Brains recordings and without that little click sound in there. And now we can just do it with editing waveforms. So yeah, that all seemed very logical and very, like I was just waiting, like somebody, Let's, so did you foresee this. it looking like this, yes. like the way that it, and did you foresee it being as fast as it was and, and like the ability to be so portable, the ability that you could like literally sit in your car waiting for someone and be mastering something on yes. your, on your phone or on your laptop. Yeah. You know, a fellow who just passed away, got in Gordon Moore, uh, truly one of the fathers of, you know, Silicon Valley and so forth, um, back in the seventies, sixties, fifties, long time ago. Um, he was working uh, at an upstart up in what became known as Silicon Valley um, called Fairchild for a guy named uh, Shockley, who was a Nobel Prize winner, but a vowed racist and a bad manager. So uh, uh, he, Gordon Moore, and a bunch of his employees uh, quit, became known as the Fairchildren. And uh, they started a company called Intel. Uh, and they had an Air Force contract that was coming due. Uh, and they uh, couldn't get the numbers to work. Uh, they couldn't get the bid to fit what the Air Force was looking for, and uh, you know they couldn't stay in business. They couldn't make a profit uh, selling uh, this technology that the Air Force needed. But Gordon Moore stepped up. He says, "Yes, we can." He goes underbid it by you know like forty percent, and his partner Noyce says, "Dude, you we're going to go bankrupt." He says, "No." He says, "Every two years, the technology is going to double in power, and the price is going to be cut in half." So if we start today, by the time we're done in two years, the math is going to work out just fine. So that became known as Moore's Law. And he was right. For the next 40 years, every two years, the technology would double. The cost would get cut in half. And so you could, you know, uh, put in a job bid knowing that the numbers would pencil out in a couple years' time. So for me, taking that to heart in the music business, <clears throat> I knew that the same uh, uh, same uh, situation was at play, that you could have... Uh, the technology advancing at a logarithmic sort of a, a, a ratio in terms of how quickly things are going to move along and how to stay on top of that. So when I'm not, you know, slaving over a hot mixing board, you know, I'm reading, you know, blogs and, you know, magazines and tape gear off. sluts and tape off, all those things, you know, uh, downloading owner's manuals, demoing, you know, equipment, getting into AI uh, gear, uh, that's becoming pretty commonplace now. Where do you see I it? mentioned I had the Akai MPC-60 back in 1988, back when Roger Lynn made me one of his beta testers. So I was always experimenting, fooling around, sometimes, honestly, to a fault. Sometimes I made mistakes because I was moving a little too fast. I was uh, trying things out that I probably shouldn't have tried. I was uh, using bands as guinea pigs because I was trying to, you know, uh, raise the bar as much as I could. And sometimes I think I, as they say, got ahead of my skis a little bit. Um, Where do you see AI going? Uh, well, now we see uh, programs that will not only do chord structures, but they'll write melodies. Uh, obviously they have the ability to write words. So lyrics for, you know, right around the corner. So I think that uh, like with any new technology, with any new art form, you know, there's people uh, that will master it and will use it for the common good. Uh, as well as people who won't, you know. Um, but that's true with any uh, change in uh, technology, whether it's, uh, you know, the written word. You know, you think about, Evan, that, you know, 7,000 years ago, we had, uh, you know, the Assyrians, you know, tapping away on stone tablets, you know, and you can still read those stone tablets, you know, seven millennia later. 
or 4,000 years ago, the Dead Sea Scrolls, we can still unfurl them and read what the ancient Hebrew text was. Yet, I can do a song in the year 2015, eight years ago, right, with all the latest and greatest modern technology, and I try to open it today in the year 2023, <laughs> it doesn't open. Oh, missing extensions. Uh, it's 32-bit, you need 64-bit. So, I mean, you know, the musical legacy, as I mentioned, if you want on the way out, you can go into the tape vault and you can see a collection of two-inch tapes that goes back, you know, 30, 40 years, and you can still play those tapes. You know, push play, they'll play. Uh, but you try to open a computer file from just a few years ago, it won't open, it won't play. Um, so I, that's what I fear the most, is that as the technology advances, we're going to be in a situation where, you know, people 100 years from now, if they try to open a JPEG, you know, of a photograph from back here now, might not be able to see so-and-so's wedding pictures. The, the, the technology then won't allow it to be opened, you know. So that's what I fear the most about technology is whether it's AI or whether it's, you know, digital technology or anything moving into the future, if it moves too fast and if people aren't conscious about uh, keeping tabs of older films, look at the silver nitrate films that uh, deteriorated in the cans and became explosive and therefore unreadable, or the old Tonight Show tapes that were erased over at Olympic Studios in London, all the Who's uh, master recordings were thrown into a dumpster. You know, because they felt that they didn't need the tapes around any longer. The worst example is Universal. I don't want to get too much on the soapbox here, but you know they had a fire up there many years ago. Oh yeah. And they tried to keep it from the public, uh, and tens of thousands of masters from Ella Fitzgerald to Tom Petty were all lost. They didn't have them cataloged. They didn't have them safely stored. So my fear as technology marches forward is that we won't pay enough attention to the past, and therefore be in danger of losing it. And artwork cannot be duplicated it cannot be replicated once the mojo is gone it's literally irreplaceable so that's why here i've always feared fire much more so than theft you know because equipment can replace it you can buy another mixing board buy more microphones but you know like you mentioned rochambeau if i've got the master tapes for those you can't replace those